Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. As you are aware, these lectures are being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We are in module 4 of these series of lectures um, and you are aware that the fourth module is devoted entirely to literary criticism. We have several schools of criticism here which we are going to talk about uh, to, to discuss and we have already been through two of these and today the topic is Marxist literary criticism. In the last uh, two lectures we saw um, you know we, we looked at some of the important postulations okay, given by classical literary criticism and by liberal humanism. And we are now today moving into a very important if not the most important um, school of literary criticism which has had a rich tradition and a long history. Before we go to Marxist literary criticism proper, it is very important for us to know what Marxism as an approach, as an ideology, um, well as um, a critical tool, okay, as an analytical tool um, entails. Right? Uh, some of you, uh, we are sure, are aware of the main postulates the main uh, theoretical you would say or you could say the, the main propositions of Marxist liter of Marxist Marxism as a whole. But let us um, at the beginning of today's lecture uh, first look at what the main points in Marxism are right. You are aware that the two most important figures in Marxism are Karl Marx and his collaborator Frederick Engels. And you are also aware that the most perhaps the most famous treatise by them written by them uh, is entitled the communist manifesto. Okay. Now, what exactly is Marxism right or uh, as an approach and as I said as a tool as an analytical tool studying society politics. Okay, philosophy, literature, right? What are the most important things that we as students of language or literature ought to know, right? So, let us come to the first slide here. Generally, their approach is known as historical materialism. Now, we need to look at first at these two terms, okay historical and materialism or history and matter. Before we ask the important questions within historical materialism, we need to know what materialism is. Okay. Materialism does not mean materialistic or somebody who uh, you know uh, somebody for whom material things or say luxury goods or consumer goods are uh, you know uh, are uh, very dear or are you know somebody who lives a life that is known as a materialistic quote unquote materialistic life. Okay. Here it is different. Materialism is usually understood um, versus another term in philosophy namely idealism. Okay. Now, I obviously I cannot go uh, you know uh, into detail about these, but suffice it for us here to no, that idealism is an approach, is an uh, is a school of thought, is an ideology, okay, so to speak, that looks, you know, or that considers the idea or the spirit, okay, as uh, the most, um, you know, or as the source, okay, source of whether it is life or the source of meaning or the source of our destinies, okay, the. Well, one of the most important proponents of idealism uh, was the German philosopher uh, G. W. F. Hegel. 
right hegel believed in what is what he called the absolute spirit okay he believed uh, in a in a or in a platonic sort of way okay where we, we we know that plato believed in forms that are eternal and this world being only a mere reflection of those eternal forms right likewise hegel believed in the idea that everything emanated from an eternal idea idea with a capital i okay idea and that we are a mere reflection of that eternal idea or god or absolute spirit right on the other hand materialism completely rejects the idea or you know uh, the idea or uh, you know forms or god or absolute spirit as the source of all life all meaning and all movement in history okay materialism holds that matter is supreme okay that all meaning all life all social arrangements uh, our destiny so to speak now here by destiny I do not mean the way we understand destiny in uh, you know preordained sort of a religious sort of ways that destiny is simply how our lives are going to work themselves out. Okay. The source of all, all this is matter more about that a while. So, uh, suffice it for us to understand here at this stage simply with these two terms historical materialism that the source of all meaning the source of our life the source of all our arrangements social economic political is matter and it has a historical uh, you know it has a history behind it right the kind of lives that we are leading here today is a result of history looked at from a material sense. Okay. So, you understand what materialism is that it is not being materialistic in the sense of liking uh, you know uh, have fancy cars etcetera. Right? So, let us look at this slide here what would historical materialism seek to study? Historical materialism seeks to study things like the organization and structure of societies. Okay. So, it would ask questions like how are societies organized and structured? And second, how do these societies develop and change? Okay. So, in the first case is really the, uh, the structure and the organization of society and the second is society in motion. Okay. What leads to social change? Why do societies change? Okay. We know that societies do not remain the same, social arrangements, rules, regulation, norms, etcetera, okay, the kind of lives that we lead uh, are uh, you know these are never the same, these change. So, Marxism uh, through its histor you know historical materialist okay, approach seeks to give us answers. right? So, here we see in this slide that the structure of societies and the causes of change of societies, the movement of societies, okay, the nature of their movement, these are uh, you know basically speaking these are the things that are sought to be understood by Marxism as a whole. As you know we have not yet uh, moved into Marxist literary criticism. Next again the two uh, two very important terms in Marxism. Okay, so we know that we are we study socio-cultural change, uh, structure, organization, and change. Okay, and we ask the question: How, why do societies change, and what are the causes of social change? Right. So Marx held that, uh, among other things, the forces of production. Okay, those productive forces which contribute towards our the production of our material lives right and the relations of production that is the relations um, between you know or among uh, people in the in the production process right among uh, people are <coughs> sorry are determined by or are related to so to speak to the forces of production okay these together we understand as what we what they called uh, what, what, the, what Marx called the mode of production that is every historical epoch is going to be characterized by a certain mode, okay? a certain mode of production, okay? certain mode of production or you could say a certain way of production. Right. Now, let me give you a few examples what are these modes of production? Modes of production uh, are as we know these are you know this really is a 
is it's, it's, it's interesting that Marxism is both a micro and a macro theory. Okay? So, if you look at history, history is explained in Marxism as uh, you know uh, marked by different ways of production. Production of what? Production of essentially our material lives. Right? Now, examples here would be for instance ancient slavery. In ancient slavery, you had a certain way of production. In feudalism, you had a certain way of production where land was the most important factor and the relations of production essentially were you know maybe characterized by two sort of binary uh, you know binary uh, opposite um, uh, social, uh, social st uh, strata like for instance uh, the landlord and on the other hand the tenant who works on the land and on the landlord's farm. Uh, farm sorry. Okay. Now, uh, these, these are relations of production which are sort of corresponding to the to the mode of production that is there in the time. So, social change is explained as uh, you know a crisis so to speak happening in in history okay, during certain times when the forces of production are uh, you know um, the forces of production are not sort of in sync with the relations of production. Okay, when the forces of production um, are uh, uh, they develop at such a what are forces of production? Forces of production um, uh, you know uh, are different factors that go into the production process. Technology could be one science and technology for instance. Okay, and these are uh, the social organization is such that they the social relations of production act as as Marx says um, act as chains or fetters on the forces of production. The forces of production eventually uh, sort of are free or free themselves from the uh, social uh, relations of production and society moves into. You know, if you if you want to understand the, the why, uh, understand the source of why society changes, okay, is because the forces of production and relations of production are sort of at odds, right? And the forces of production, um, you know, sort of are free from the social relations of production, and society moves on to another epoch, okay? Then the 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 next important terms are the base and the superstructure. Marx argued that every in every society and every mode of production, every epoch, there is what we call we can have a two tier almost an architectural sort of metaphor is used here, a two tier structure of um, you know and sort of an infrastructural base okay, and the superstructure. The base if you look at the slide here, the base comprises again the forces of production and the relations of production. Okay. The base is an economic base to put it very simply here of course, the base is an economic base. Now, Marx says that according to right, this is very important according to the nature of the economic base, there would arise corresponding superstructural elements. Now, in the superstructure he, he said that these are essentially to put it you know uh, uh, to use one term only for it is is these are cultural elements for instance corresponding to now remember we are using words like corresponding to okay we are marx never meant that these are deterministic that the base is completely going to determine okay he kept it more uh, you know he gave it more space really and he understood the enormous complexity of the superstructural elements. Okay. So, he says that these are determined by or these correspond to right, uh, the economic base and here we find the legal system for instance, uh, then a social a very important social institution like the family, religion, education and eventually our consciousness. Now, when we study Marx's literary criticism, what are we going to do? Where are we going to place the literary text? It is obvious to us that the literary text would be in the superstructure. Am I correct here? Okay. The, the, the products art for instance, the products of our consciousness right like art will also be related to 
the economic base that is the forces of production and the relations of production or what we may call the mode of production. This is very important for us to understand before we go to study what Marx's literary criticism is. Okay? Again to quickly recapitulate, Marxism studies or Marxism, the aim of Marxism is to study the organization and structure of society. Okay? Second, to, to study how societies and why societies change, how they develop from one epoch to another. Okay? We call it historical materialism because we understand the past in, uh, in terms of or in relation to in very important relation to history or to the, you know, uh, the present to history. That is the present is always uh, determined by history and you know we, we do away with the idealist a Hegelian way of looking at the idea is the most important source of everything and here the idea is replaced by matter. So, our material economic arrangements right, give rise which is the base give rise to the superstructural elements in our culture among, among uh, which we find art also or being a very important part. Okay. So, Marx lay great great um, importance on social consciousness right for instance as we'll find later on he said that our consciousness does not uh, determine uh, you know uh, our consciousness and uh, or uh, you know does not determine uh, you know the kind of societies we have but it is the kind of societies we have that eventually or that will always determine the kind of consciousness that we have. Here when we say consciousness, we do not mean simply you know aware you know as being conscious or as being aware of things right. We mean by consciousness here, we mean really our everything our mental consciousness, our emotional consciousness, our intellectual consciousness, um, uh, our moral consciousness right. So, all, all our norms, our so called virtues, our so called uh, uh, you know uh, evil aspects or you know everything that is part of our consciousness, our ideas of good and bad, our ideas of for instance the best social and the best economic or the best political uh, arrangement, okay, our ideas of the best literary text for instance, okay, these are all to be understood. Uh, in the term consciousness here, it is not just being like I am conscious or I am aware of my surroundings in a sort of cognitive sort of way. Okay? So, um, let us read from this slide which will make uh, this first point clear to us. Okay? When we talk about historical materialism, we have to remember these, uh, uh, these words from Marxism okay, that men make their own history but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly found, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. Now, we obviously these, these are these words are beautifully put. This, this says that we uh, there is no doubt we make our own history or we make our own destinies, okay? but the past plays a most important part in sort of the carving out of our destinies or of our histories. Now, we are going to move into Marx's literary criticism proper and what I have done in this um, lecture is obviously there are several ways you know in which you can uh, or we could talk about um, a Marxist literary criticism. Okay, sometimes we can just refer to one book, for instance, Terry Eagleton's very important book uh, on on uh, Marxist literary criticism. What I have done here, however, is I've try you know tried to bring to you um, some of the important formulations, uh, comments, and pronouncements on Marxist literary criticism from a couple of sources. Okay, so in in a bit to enrich our understanding of Marxism and. In that, uh, with that view in mind, we have first a quotation from Plekhanov, right, who says that the social mentality of an age is conditioned by that age's social relations. 
this is nowhere quite as evident as in the history of art and literature. Okay. We talked about social relations of production just a while ago when we referred to the two very important terms the forces of production and the, and the social relations of production in Marxism. Okay. Now, this is how we move into literary criticism for Marxism and one of the better ways is to put it through Plekhanov for instance. What does he say? He says here that the social mentality of any age okay, is conditioned or is determined by the social relations of that age. Right. This is a point also when we uh, we saw when we talked about the uh, you know the base and the superstructure. Okay, the base. Now here, Plekhanov lays more importance on the social relations of production. He says that the social relations of production. Now again, what is the social relation of production? Okay, simply put, for instance, in a capitalist system, okay, the the worker, right, the worker and um, you know the owner of the means of production. Okay. Uh, the capitalist that is a relation social relation of production okay the relation between or among workers that also is a relation of production which is determined by the way the production process is arranged is very important okay uh, and the economic mode of production that is on and the forces the nature of the forces of production even the degree of development of the forces of production okay now the social relations condition the kind of mentality now this mentality is also related to the word consciousness that we found a while ago okay so plekhanov says that you know how are we to gauge how are we to understand the nature, okay, even the complexities of the social mentality of any age. He says, you, uh, you only need to look at the art and particularly the literature okay, of a certain period. The literature of a certain period is more or less going to tell you what the social mentality of that particular epoch was like. Right? Now, obviously, it is not uh, so simple as that you know the the uh, that uh, the uh, all the literary text of a certain age is going to be reflective of its social relations it is of course far more complex and it should be so but if we have to theorize on the nature of the literary text in relation to the mentality social collective mentality of a particular period then we can safely say that the literature of a period okay shows us the social mentality in all again qualifying it okay in all its complexities in all its different hues right in all its pro in, 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 in all its prob problematics okay of the, that arises from the social relations of that particular epoch and go back where does the social relation come from where do the social relations of a particular age come from? They eventually come from the mode of production or the economic arrangement. Do you understand? Now, in from this slide really what we have done is we have begun to relate um, the literary text to uh, Marx's propositions or to Marx's statements. Do you follow? I hope this is, this is an important point here, in important juncture in our lecture today. right? So, we talked about historical materialism based on superstructure, forces of production, relations of production and we come to the, we have come to the literary text as being you know um, as being a complex indicator so to speak of the social mentality that arises from the social relations and the economic relations of an age. Okay? So, this really is one of the, uh, you know the part of the theorizing of the literary text in relation to Marxism. Now, we will go straight to a quotation from Karl Marx himself okay, from the Grundriss. Now, many say that Marx uh, and also Engels did not really you know talk so much about the literary text about literature. Okay. Uh, whatever you find are more or less uh, sort of sporadic. There are collections on Marx and Engels on literature and art for instance, okay. but it is said that their, their, their main focus was not obviously the literary text, but you know there are some brilliant insights that we get uh, particularly from Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. 
Okay. When you look at some whenever or wherever they do talk about literature, art um, and its relation you know their relation to so, uh, uh, you know to social relations and forces of production, the modes of production, we, we find some brilliant insights that are given which are then taken up by other scholars who, um, who practice criticism or theory from a Marxist perspective. One such quotation and uh, this is something that is oft quoted is from the Grundris. Now, let us read from here. Marx asks this question, is Achilles possible when powder and shot have been invented? And is the Iliad possible at all when the printing press and even printing machines exist? Okay? So, here first we find that Marx is through you know asking these questions is actually making a statement okay, that in a time when there was the printing machine and uh, the printing press, uh, epics like the Iliad okay, uh, by Homer uh, would not have been possible. In a way what is he saying? He's, see he is tying the literary text and epic to the material uh, realities of its time okay by contrasting it uh, the material realities of the time of homer to the material realities of uh, england for instance during the time of the printing press of uh, the time of caxton um, he's proposing this that an epic like the iliad would not have been written in a time of the printing press you the time of the printing press is also the time of the beginning of uh, you know the rise of the middle class okay the which is again important for the rise of the novel so the epic now takes a new form which is the novel in a time which is you know in a time which is very different okay not just uh, you know not just as you know uh, uh, not uh, not from the point of view of the ideas that were uh, you know extend during that time, but also from the point of view of the material conditions. Okay. Let us read this again. Is Achilles possible when powder and gunshot have been invented and is the Iliad possible at all when the printing press and even printing machines exist? Is it now he asks is it not inevitable that with the emergence of the press bar the singing and the telling and the muse cease? that is the conditions necessary look at this the conditions necessary for epic poetry disappear in this question really he is giving us a statement that the way of the epic the nature of the epic okay is bound to disappear okay with the changes that are or with the disappearance of a certain material way of life do you understand okay it says singing the telling and the muse these cease to exist Okay, the, 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 these factors of the epic, these cease to exist you know with the emergence of the press. Okay. So, now again this is yet another example of how material uh, the, how uh, materialism is then in this sense understood as the source okay, of what even uh, of even the genre right. How material changes in material lives can also change. Um, or in material conditions can also change the, change the very genre of, okay, of literary text. Then uh, it is often argued that you know with Marxism okay, uh, uh, a way of writing which is the realist mode is deeply entwined. Right? Now, Marx's and Engels' demands on the artist. Now, most of what I am reading here uh, is from Terry Eagleton. Okay? Marx's and Engels' demands on the artist include truthfulness of depiction, right? almost a very similitude, okay? truthfulness of depiction, a concrete historical approach to the events described and personages with live and individual traits reflecting typical aspects of the character and psychology of the class milieu to which they belong. Okay, there, so, there is a certain not a mere reflectionism, not a simplistic reflectionism, but um, you know from a Marxist point of view we would expect right, we would expect that the characters 
that are depicted in a novel for instance, right, uh, which is again you know uh, which is again constrained by time and space, you know uh, where uh, uh, where we know okay, from which social milieu these characters come from, at uh, the time during which the, the time of the setting of a novel for instance. Okay. Uh, Marx and Engels required or Marxism requires that the artist be faithful in his, depic his or her depiction of the characters, it says uh, the, uh, the, the, the characters where even the individual, right, the individual traits of individual characters have to correspond to a certain type that was, uh, you know, um, uh, that was characteristic of a certain time. Okay. Now, let us quickly read this again, Marx and Engels demands on the artist include truthfulness of depiction, a concrete historical approach to the events described and personages with live and indi uh, individual traits reflecting typical aspects of the character and psychology of the class milieu to which they belong. The author of genuinely realistic works communicates his ideas to the reader not by didactic philosophizing. Right? but by vivid images which affect the reader's consciousness and feelings by their artistic expressiveness. This word is very important here didactic. There are many uh, you know many scholars uh, who are how shall we put it who are uh, who are anti Marxist or who do not um, uh, who argue against Marxist literary criticism. Importantly, by saying that Marxist literary, Marxist literary criticism is didactic, right? So, in the sense that it, it is, as they say, too ideological, right? That it is almost uh, again propagandist. But as Eagleton says, Marx, Marxist literary criticism um, expects, right? A that the artist, when he or she is uh, you know, uh, is sketching his characters, delineating events, for instance, a be true to the 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 actualities of those times. Okay, and instead instead of philosophizing in a di didactic or even in a doctrinal fashion, right, would with vivid, realist, okay, realist or realistic images, right, uh, express their ideas. Or, or, or uh, you know, uh, have the literary piece come out as an artistic expression, okay, which is far above the, you know, the the didactic or moralizing philosophy that one would expect. This is very important. What the, what this also suggests that Marxist literary criticism was not looking for propagandist kind of literature. It only asks that there there be a connection, okay. Uh, there be not simply a connection, but there be a faithful, you know, uh, depiction of the time and the types of characters that that were or are there in a particular in a particular uh, stretch of time or space. Now, uh, let me quote from. Uh, Yaus, okay, his uh, essay "Literary History as a Challenge to Literary Theory," because here it, uh, he makes an important distinction, he, he talks about Marxism by making an important distinction between another school of thought that you uh, many of us are here are aware of that is a formalism particularly of the Russian school. Now, he says that the formalist school needs the reader only as a perceiving subject, right, who follows the directions in the text in order to perceive its form or discover its techniques or of procedure. As you know form was enormously important in Russian formalism that is why the word formalism right form and uh, he says that it is only enough for the reader to kind of uh, discover you know uh, the techniques or the formal aspects take joy and pleasure in sort of unraveling the you know identifying the formalist nature of you know uh, formalist elements in a text. Okay. It assumes that the reader has the theoretical knowledge of a philologist sufficiently versed in the tools of literature to be able to reflect on them. So, you one expects that the reader should be in formalism should be well acquainted with you know the various tools or uh, tools of, anal of analyzing literary texts and should be able to discover so to speak the beauty of the formal elements. 
On the other hand, he says, the Marxist school, on the other hand, actually equates the spontaneous experience. This is important. Okay, where here the reader is assumed to be, you know, as he says, sufficiently well versed or well trained okay, in understanding the literary text. But on the other hand, he says, on the Marxist school actually equates to look at this word here, the spontaneous experience of the reader with the scholarly interest of historical materialism. Now, by spontaneous we are not stopping at simply spontaneously experiencing a literary text okay along with one spontaneous response to a literary text one also expects the reader to bring in his or her uh, scholarly interest of historical materialism which again let's read which seeks to discover relationships between now this is most important discover here you discover the form okay or the technique and take sort of you know uh, take pleasure out of disco uh, disco you know discovering the uh, you know the nuances of technique and procedure on the other hand in the marxist uh, uh, you know approach what we do is we see, uh, we discover not the formal elements but let's look at this here seeks to discover the relationships okay relationship between the economic basis of production and the literary work as part of the intellectual superstructure this i need you to really look at very carefully because it's really i bought in yarsh's words here you know it's the, because it really i think it strikes the right code okay by saying that it is there is not that Marxist literary criticism engages itself only with kind of an archival work or almost you could say an even an architectural sort of work where you are trying to dig out history and trying to make you know a correlations between um, the text and uh, you know uh, the or the text position in history in space and time. It says no, there is great uh, joy, this great spontaneity of the reader, and when the reader is equipped right with understanding the historical realities of the text then the pleasure the so called readerly pleasure of you know or the pleasure of reading a text comes when you discover as he says the relationship here between the economic basis of a particular age of uh, uh, you know and in its production process and the literary work as remember the part of the part of what part of the consciousness the cultural consciousness of a time or what he calls here the intellectual part of the intellectual production of the superstructure okay this is very important for us to understand again who are the three scholars we saw here a plecano a of course marx himself when he asks the question right uh, would the iliad have been possible okay or uh, uh, why or in, on the other hand why is an epic uh, not the most important genre uh, during say for do you say the uh, say 18th century England right it is because the material conditions have changed okay second we looked at um, Georgi Plekhanov who said that the social mentality of an age is related to its social relations okay and we also know that the social relations are related to the forces of production the economic arrangements and he claimed that uh, nowhere is this relation most well you know sort of demonstrated than in the art and literature of a time. Okay. Then we found uh, uh, through Terry Eagleton uh, when he talks uh, you know when he talks about um, the literary text here when he talks about um, uh, when he talks about realism okay, uh, and he talks about the, the importance or even the expectation uh, in Marxist literary criticism that there has there should be you know a faithful depiction of uh, of characters uh, you know um, uh, of, of setting right according to the historical time in which the text is set. Then we came to Yaus who talks about who compares Marxist literary criticism and the formalist school and says that where as in the formalist uh, school we we uh, try to unravel you know uh, we try to get pleasure you know in the reading process by unraveling the formal structures of a text okay by unraveling you know the procedures that have been used okay um, in contrast to that in in Marxist literary criticism we have you know the spontaneous reading of a text tied to an understanding of the historical realities of that text and understanding a text a writer as 
you know part of the superstructural uh, elements of any age. Okay, as it says here, to discover the relationship between the economic base of production and the literary work as part of the intellectual superstructure. Okay, these are immensely important formulations. I would really say these are the core formulations that uh, those of you who are beginning Marxist literary criticism, we know this lecture is uh, really a basic level um, uh, lecture in a basic level course okay, that has been designed uh, for students particularly in engineering colleges who have their first exposure to, to language and literature. Okay. It is important for us to understand this systematically right to to find out what marxism says a about society okay about social change and organization and b where the literary text lies as far as the entire marxist framework is concerned what according to them is the function of uh, uh, the literary text and and secondly oh, you know how is a reader to approach a literary text, how is a reader to understand or perceive a literary text and we saw this in contrast to the formalist school. Okay, then coming back to Terry Eagleton and uh, again quoting from Marxism and literary criticism, Eagleton says art and literature were part of the very air Marx breathed as a formidably cultured German intellectual in the great classical tradition of his society. Right. Marx, in fact, um, some of you may not know, Marx also uh, had written poetry, right? And he had um, he had great um, uh, he had great uh, admiration for you know for the greatest of the writers like Shakespeare, for instance. And if you read Das Kapital uh, and, and some of his other works, you'll be surprised to find <coughs> excuse me the literary allusions that we find in his text. We find here evidence of an absolutely fine mind who was not uh, simply looking only you know uh, you know only to make certain theoretical formulations on economics on culture on uh, you know on culture in the sense of the material lives that we lead but we find here a person who was also you know also so well versed in literature and some of his writings really read. Uh, like we saw in the, in the example from Grunris, really, uh, you know, read um, so you know, read so beautifully when we look at them from an aesthetic point of view. Now, Eagleton therefore says that art and literature. He describes the milieu, okay, in which Marx was was writing. Art and literature were part of the very air Marx breathed as a formidably cultured G German intellectual in the great classical tradition of his society. His ex his acquaintance with literature from Sophocles to the Spanish novel, Lucretius to pot boiling English fiction was staggering in its scope. The German workers circle he founded in Brussels devoted an evening a week to discussing the arts and Marx himself was an inveterate theatre goer, declaimer of poetry, devourer of every species of literary art from Augustan prose to industrial ballads. Okay, this is Eagleton giving us the background of how Marx was also steeped among other things in literature. Right? Then we uh, come to a uh, meaning in Trotsky here, because uh, here we find um, you know how should I put it a variant of Marxist literary criticism that was you know that many feel was deeply uh, deeply polemical. Uh, almost uh, so to speak you know propagandist right so what i want to do here is it, you know uh, bring to you what bring to you what trotsky um, uh, trotsky uh, kind of argued for okay in his seminal book literature and revolution published in 1924 okay so this kind of trotsky's variant of marxist literary criticism comes in for uh, quite some flack from you know people who are um, who do not really follow the Marxist school of thought. Now, let us look at this slide here. Trotsky in literature and revolution says that you know when one practices literary criticism, um, one needs to 
uh, one needs to uh, lay focus on not you know the formal aspects not on you know uh, the didactic aspects of the philosophy in the philosophy in there not on the so called spiritual aspects okay of a text he says that our job is to be polemical right to to be problematic okay to to be interventionist so that when we perform literary criticism on a text right we are not simply looking at uh, it's certainly not uh, just a description of what the text is saying we are not looking at its formal aspects we need to be interventionist the literary critic needs to intervene in the text in order to show the inequalities that are there in society okay in order to foreground the exploitation that is there in society hence it's called polemical or interventionist so he says lit let's look at the slide again literary criticism should be polemical should be interventionist uh, the literary critic should eventually help in giving shape to 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 cultural policy okay to social policy and one should declare this is very important with Trotsky and one should declare what one stance on art and <coughs> sorry culture is. Um, one should also declare one uh, declare one's uh, intellectual position, right? So Trotsky here was very clear on the job, so to speak, or the function of a writer or uh, sorry of a critic. So Trotsky says that culture feeds on the sap of economics and the material surplus is necessary so that culture may grow develop and become subtle he says in the social roots and the social function of literature that our marxist conception of the objective social dependence and social utility of art when translated into the language of polit politics does not at all mean a desire to dominate art by means of decrees and orders okay here is trotsky um, uh, seeking to defend okay, his view of what Marx, a, Mar a Marxist criticism ought to be like. Okay. He says, we uh, just because we want to study the objective social dependence and the social utility of art does not make, does not mean that it is propagandist. Right? So, we will stop here indeed there is so much else uh, to talk about um, I could only bring uh, just a few critics here uh, we should have also looked at Lukács and his theory of the novel and um, uh, we could have also looked at some of uh, you know uh, the way in which some of the texts may be looked at from you know an actual text could have been decoded from a Marxist perspective. What I uh, wanted to do is first to bring to you some of the you know the very core the very elementary things that we should know about Marxism because you cannot go straight to Marx's literary criticism without knowing what Marx had to say about society about the organization structure of society and the, and why you know social uh, uh, the social change happens in the first place and we therefore saw um, well let, what uh, let me let me now uh, you know pose some questions right so that we can we do this recap by posing some questions. For instance, if I ask you a question like this, um, how, um, how did Marx okay, look at social structure and social change? How are we going to answer that question? Okay? One of the ways in which to answer obvious, this question obviously is to say that Marxism is um, an approach which is historical, which is materialist. Then we go on to say uh, the importance uh, talk about the importance of history in Marxism in, in general in Marx's general theory in particular and we say that um, the source um, the source of meaning the source of uh, you know understanding a literary text the source of our social lives our, our cultural arrangements the source of the kind of the nature of our social relations that we have and eventually the source of the, the literary text is not uh, you know uh, is not something that is uh, out, you know that is that is sort of outside of the material world that we live in the source is not the idea okay we have to go beyond the idea and and say that our social consciousness our literary consciousness comes from matter that is the most important thing matter in the sense of the way our material lives are arranged right the way ways in which 
the uh, economic base works right. The rules and regulations which determine the production, the distribution and consumption of material goods that leads to a, as we understood a superstructure right. That base leads to a superstructure and that superstructure is conditioned though of course, in very complex ways okay, uh, by the economic base and what was uh, uh, what is entailed in the superstructure? In the superstructure, we found are entailed social institutions like the family, like religion, okay, like education and consciousness, art, literature. Okay. Uh, second, if uh, you know, uh, we we if we ask um, how how is uh, sort of how is the literary text, the social mentality of an age, and third. Uh, the social relations of an age, how are these related? Okay. Then we take recourse to Plekhanov's work, uh, words for instance and we say that uh, Marx's literary text looks at the social mentality, um, uh, Marx's literary criticism looks at so the social mentality of an age as being best demonstrated or indicated so to speak by art and literature. Art and literature are the best, best vehicles so to speak okay, uh, of the social mentality of an age. Now, that social mentality is again related to the social relations of productions that are there at a certain given point of time. And finally, the social relations of production are determined by, by what the way the economic arrangement is done in society. To follow, okay. Then next, we may ask a question like, uh, "What is you know?" Um, uh, we can ask, "What is uh, you know the mode of writing that is most uh, conducive, so to speak, to Marxist literary criticism, or that is expected from a writer?" And we say that the realist mode is the mode of writing that is uh, most conducive uh, to an artist. Uh, according to Marxist literary criticism and the realist mode uh, demands this from an artist that he or she does not uh, sort of go away from the type okay, the type of uh, characters that are I could say possible in a certain age or in a certain given uh, socio cultural milieu right. We cannot move away from that if we have to be faithful to our depiction uh, you know or in our depiction of characters and setting. The setting should also reflect so to speak okay, in however problematic and co complex a way should be reflective of the actual material conditions that were extant in that time. Okay. So, this is uh, demanded from um, the and in, in this case it is really perhaps the realist novel, the realist novel that uh, you know is the best exemplar of what Marxist literary criticism expects a writer to do, right. So, we that was what and we also remember Marx saying in the Grunris that the epic is not uh, sort of possible, okay. Of course, one can self consciously write, you know, take a say that well, I am in the 21st century and I am going to write an epic. We are not talking about that. The epic is in a different sense, not possible in a time. Uh, where for instance there is a printing press and where material conditions are very different from say ancient Greek, Greece for instance. Okay. And then in there we saw he said that the Iliad is not possible, um, you know the characters like Achilles are not possible in a time when the material conditions are very different. Okay. It is very important for us, you know there are many critiques of what of what is called the vulgar school of Marxist criticism in the sense that. Uh, uh, um, in the sense that one always expects, okay, one always expects a propagandist kind of writing, while where always, you know, for instance, the worker is, uh, uh, you know, the worker is shown to be to be in a very simplistic way, the finest of characters, whereas uh, the, uh, for instance, the uh, the capitalist is shown to be, you know, where the characters are not fleshed out, there are no complexities. That's the vulgar kind of Marxist criticism that uh, many have. Uh, perhaps rightly so attack. Okay. We also looked at Trotsky and literature and revolution, uh, one of uh, you know the, the classic uh, uh, pieces in Marxist literary criticism and one that has been attacked also a lot by, uh, by uh, scholars who are against uh, 
as Marxist literary criticism by pointing to the fact that he always asks for interventionist you know an intervention is more by the literary critic and by the artist uh, for polemics for you know eventually shaping cultural policy right but trotsky himself says that well just because we want to find out the oh, you know uh, you know and sort of a scientific systematic objective we want to carry out an objective inquiry through the literary text into the socio cultural relations of production into the economic base doesn't mean that we are doing it in a doctrinaire sort of way, right. So, there is the, uh, you perhaps sought a balance between you know uh, the pleasure of reading a text for its own sake and of course, bringing in social change by showing the, the, the way the text uh, willingly or unwillingly okay, uh, reveals the social inequalities and the realities of exploitation of a certain age. Okay. So, these are some of the questions that are important that may come up. Well, there is indeed so much else to talk about as far as Marxist literary con, uh, situ, uh, sorry, criticism is concerned, but stay with this. Okay. It is enough for us at this juncture to simply look at these these uh, important points, this the same foundational points that we have raised in our lecture and in uh, the next lecture, we shall move on with another school of criticism. Uh, thank you for now, see you next time.